we'll just give a few of our colleagues just a minute to, to get their seats and, and settle down. Then we can start. I think those who are still collecting their corporate gifts, it might be best to collect them perhaps at the end. So if you can just maybe quickly grab our seats and then we can start with the, with the formal program. And I can assure you, it's a relatively short program. We should be done in, 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 in not so long. And um, if you cooperate, it can be even shorter for that matter, I can assure you. <laughs> so. Um, just so you know we are live, uh, there are a few of our colleagues who are tuning in uh, virtually joining this session. So I would like to welcome them as well who are joining in from their offices, from their cell phones. And the risky ones I know they are joining from driving as well. I know a colleague of mine who, who is capable of that. <laughs> but um, before I go any further, I want to introduce myself. My name is Dumi Lem Lambo. I'm the public relations manager at the SAMRC, but uh, today I'm wearing a slightly different cap, and uh, I'm just here really to, to help us navigate the short program. It's really just to say where to from here. It, it's really a fairly easy job for me. And, uh, and of course, before we start, I've got a couple of requests, you know, not necessarily ground rules, not necessarily, it's just those things that would make our lives easy. Of course, the first one would be switching off our cell phones. Not off, maybe put them on silence or vibration. Uh, I know all of us here occupy very important positions in society, so it may be difficult to switch them off completely. So at least on silence, you can always be able to respond. Um, so that is my, my first request. I know most of us, myself included, I've got Microsoft Teams on my cell phone. So the last thing you want is when somebody's speaking and then you hear that do, 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 do. We just trying to avoid that. But uh, without wasting any time, uh, I'm going to call upon Professor Atlanta Gray, uh, the president and CEO of the SAMRC, just to come and assure you that feel free, feel at home, you are welcome, and just give you a bit of background of why we are here. Professor Gray. Thanks, Dimili. Hi. So it's, a nice, it's, it's a nice Monday morning, so thank you all for coming. So I'm going to, it's just my job, it's going to be five minutes just to welcome you. But I wanted to introduce you to some of the people around the, the room. So first of all, I want to acknowledge, on behalf of Sandile Butelezi, our DG, we have our Chief Director, Health Promotion, Nutrition and Oral Health, Dr. Lin Moeng Moshlangu, who's going to give the address on behalf of, of Sandile. So there, there we are. If you're interested in nutrition and oral health, you go to her afterwards. Um, I also want to introduce other parts, uh, the other people of the NDOH that are here. Paul, where are you? I saw Paul, who else, who am I missing? Ah, oh, there you are, nice to see you as well. Okay, so this is our NDOH folks and we really appreciate their support. They navigate our budgets for us. Um, they navigate um, the work that we do and we really appreciate the support that the NDOH has, so thank you very much. Um, we also want to welcome the University Vice Chancellors and Principals who are here within our admiss, and maybe you can put your hand up. There we are. Thank you so much for coming, just so that we can, so everyone can know who everybody is. Um, the Deputy Vice Chancellors for Research, I saw you, I saw a couple of you. There you are, there we are. Okay, just so everyone can see. Our deans. Where's our deans, our executive dean? There's another executive dean somewhere. Where? There we are. Um, we want to thank you for the collaboration, because obviously um, the DVCs for Research are critical partners for the MRC, as well as the, the deans, who we interact quite directly with. So thank you for coming. We also have um, people from our, our sister councils, the HSRC. There we are, Heidi. Nice to see you. Um, and the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSR. So thank you for coming. 
Um, um, we also have members of our board, and so I think these people are critical because they steer, they set the strategy, and they keep the EMC on the straight and narrow. So I know some people are doubling. Colette, are you doubling? Are you going to? Are you representing the board here or yourself? <laughs> so Colette is one of our board members, but he's also a recipient today. But our board members, we uh, let um, Johnny couldn't come. He sent a message this, this morning. Our chair, but he had um, a. Is something that came up, so he sends his regards and his best wishes. But we do have our other members of the board. There we are, June, Colette. There we are, Lindue, nice to see you. Okay, so there we are, thank you so much for coming. And then I also need to introduce you to our EMC members. We have our Vice President here, Liesl. Put up your hand. We have Mongezi. We have Angie, where's Angie? Disappeared. Who else am I missing? Yeah, Angie, am I missing anyone else? No, I think I'm fine. And then um, I wanted to um, introduce you to your big brothers or sisters, the unit directors of the intramural program. I see they're here in solidarity with the, with, with the extramural people. So our intramural folk, put your hands up so we can see you. There we are, Andre and Shay. Um, um, a, a little bit of a trio here with um, Colette, so it's very nice to see you there. And then um, our old extramural units are here as well. Um, where's, I saw some having tea. Where are you? There you are. There we are. Nice to see all of you uh, from our extramural units. Um, it'll be nice for, you, for all of you to, to, um, to, you know, to, to mix after this. Ke um, Kelly Chobadi, thank you for agreeing to give our pre note. He's going to keynote address. He's going to tell us um, how to set the stage for, for us. And I, I really look forward to hearing what you have to say. And then uh, if I've missed anyone, it's all protocol observed. Um, but before I start, I think we do have to acknowledge the, 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 the new extramural unit directors that are coming. And so I want to just ask Professor Pascal Bassong to stand up so we can see you. Where are you? I saw you. There you are. Why are you hiding away? From the University of Venda. And he will be heading the antimicrobial research um, platform. Very important uh, work as we go into the future. Colette Dandera from UCT. We'll be doing the pharmacogenomics research and translation. And Tobacco and Tuzi, the intersection between infectious diseases and, and, and communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. And then our, 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 our wonderful unit director from the University of Johannesburg, um, Professor Ufiwe Pazwane Mafuya. And lovely to have you here. And before we go any further, Rafiwe has a wonderful way of stealing the show. So even as she was walking through here, people were stopping her, taking selfies, <laughs> the cameras were there, you know, she was having to adjust and put lipstick on. And, um, but the reason why we have to celebrate, so we, we're going to give you, a, we're going to tell a little secret today because it's behind these closed doors, is that she'll be coronated as the Queen of Research by the Mbezo traditional kingdom of Ghana. Um, and she's going off after this ceremony. She's going to get on a plane, and then she's going to become a queen. <laughs> so congratulations. So it is wonderful to be here. Um, we, this would not have been possible um, uh, even six months ago, uh, definitely not a year ago, and definitely, definitely not two years ago. And um, we're just coming out of this um, most severe pandemic, South Africa was very badly affected, more than 326,000 deaths, and um, we paid a great price for our, 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 our hybrid immunity and a great price for where we are. So I just want to acknowledge all the people in our country that died of COVID and, um, and to acknowledge the work that a lot of scientists in this room did. Uh, first of all, to understand um, the natural history, to understand um, uh, immunology, to help with the vaccine rollout, and to help with, with, with everything that we did, including um, identifying Omicron. So I just want to acknowledge all the hard work that the scientists in South Africa have done um, to get us to where we are. So as you know, um, um, R&D is critical for us, and when we were looking at um, our choices for uh, an extramural unit, for extramural units this time. We wanted to look forward, um, wanted to see what the world is gonna be like in the next 10, 20 years, and position, slowly position the MRC to not only respond to diseases of the past and the present, but to pivot to the future and get us ready um, for whatever happens next. And that's why we have 
antimicrobial resistance, which is critical um, in, in our endeavors as we move forward, and possibly is, is a, an imminent pandemic as well, um, as we struggle to find new, new antibiotics. We also understand the difference, the importance of emerging non-communicable diseases and the interface between infectious and non-infectious diseases. And that's why Interbeco's research unit is, is, is critical. For Colette, um, the pharmacogenomics research, he's, you know, we, we need pharmacogenomics, we need precision medicine, and we need to pivot ourselves in a way um, towards the fourth industrial revolution. And we're hoping the work that you do is gonna do that as well. But last and not least, um, as we know, we have, to be, we have to be prepared for the future for future pandemics, and we have to pivot our country and our research to make sure that we are ready um, for the next pandemic. And that's why we have a refuse unit, and she's going to uh, uh, work towards uh, making sure that South Africa is resilient in the future. And so we welcome you as the fourth critical, um, critical um, extramural unit that we're going to launch today. So I just want to just finally, finally say that um, the MRC, um, is a collaborative organization, and we draw a lot of our strength from um, the people that we work with, both within the MRC and in the, in the universities around us. So we like to collaborate, and um, we are very excited to have you in our family to collaborate with us. And with great collaborations, it helps us to work quicker, work smarter, and achieve a whole lot more. So um, we have a very strong extramural portfolio, and we're very happy to add these new additions uh, which will definitely complement and expand the existing 24 extramural research units and the 11 intramural research units that we have. And so to, to bring together uh, a total of 39 research units at the MRC. So thank you very much for coming. This is, we want to make it um, as informal as possible. But we want to just be here to actually celebrate um, our new unit directors. Um, we could not have been luckier to get um, these four. So we are really appreciative, and thank you all for coming to enjoy and celebrate our new, our new extramural units. Thanks. Dumela, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President, Prof, Prof Gigi. Uh, I'm the only one who calls her uh, Prof Gigi. <laughs> um, so, um, I think we're going to move to our next item, which is uh, the keynote address by Professor Kelly Chibale, who is going to sort of uh, take us through, you know, the <clears throat> the, the, the role of extra re mural research units, um, you know, in, 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 in the broader context of research and, and, and innovation in South Africa. Uh, I know Prof Chibale has a, a presentation to, 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 can you come in? Professor Kelly Chibale, the stage is yours. Th thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremony, for the invitation, and uh, to the MRC, to, uh, the President Glinda, uh, Lizzo, the Vice President, and uh, of course, for the rest of you, um, all protocol observed. Um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I have been working with the MRC with this unit for um, Quite a number of years, and uh, what you'll see here um, as we move forward, um, the three key words, um, firstly, is conducting research. Secondly, it's empowering others to do research. And then thirdly, is to promote research. So those are the three themes that you'll see recurring in my presentation. Let me just make sure I can move forward. Okay. So this is the outline of what I'm gonna do. And what an opportunity with the pandemic that we've just been through, which is still going through, it's not completely over. Uh, what are the lessons that we have learned from there? Secondly, I will then talk about the first component of the talk, which is to conduct research. So I'll give you a flavor of the kind of work that we do um, in, in the unit that we, we run. And then the second, uh, the third aspect of this is how we are empowering others uh, to be equipped to do the research. And then the penultimate point is how we've been able to leverage the extramural unit to promote research at a very high level and um, scale up on what we do. And I'll finish off with uh, some takeaways. 
Okay, there are many lessons that I think we've all learned from COVID. I probably have my top eight lessons. But I've teased out these three in the context of today's discussion, uh, which is firstly, this will come really, really important, that we've seen not just the health systems challenged, but particularly for our continent, um, we've seen how this has really become so important for Africa to bolster not just our public health uh, infrastructure and capability, but importantly as well, the research and development innovation aspect. So we saw the impressive work of South African scientists um, Ronnie in identifying new variants. We saw the contribution of the science from this country to the global efforts. We saw uh, vaccine work, our president of the MRC, Glenda, involved in developing the Janssen vaccine. We've seen all of those things really play out. Um, and of course, this was an opportunity for this continent to showcase what we can contribute to R&D. But the second lesson is the importance of skills, skills, skills. Not just develop the skills, but also have mechanisms to retain those skills, to absorb them so that we can hold uh, the brain red. That's an important lesson. But thirdly, why was it possible to so quickly develop a COVID vaccine? We saw unprecedented levels of collaborations, of partnerships, of innovation. The importance of innovation is why it was possible to have vaccines in less than a year. But also unprecedented levels of collaborations. So we're talking about partnerships. It's not just research partnerships. It's also funding partnerships. Now, in terms of the first lesson, which is really the necessity for our continent to bolster um, research and development or R&D capabilities. We have been walking this journey for the last 11 or so years as part of the MOU. So what I'm gonna do in the next couple of slides is give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we've been doing on this journey and where this journey has actually landed us uh, in 2022 and what the future looks like uh, based on the track record that we've been going through. So, the last 11 years or so, we have been on a mission. We have been on a mission, and that mission is really threefold. We've been on a mission, first of all, to contribute to developing the critical infrastructure and platforms, as well as talent, to contribute to a global pipeline of, of drug leads. So, we've been involved in discovering drugs, contributing to a portfolio of potential future medicines. Secondly, and importantly, and I'm very pleased that, in fact, one of the units that we're gonna be launching today is Colette Dandara's uh, uh, unit, pharmacogenomics, very important. And we've been focused on really working to build those Africa-specific models that will allow us to prioritize, for example, if we're doing drug discovery, those molecules at a very early stage that we can prioritize based upon their predicted uh, profile in African patients. So on one hand, we need to address the low volume of clinical trials that we have on the continent, but on the other, on the preclinical side of things, before medicines even get tested in people, develop the tools that allow us to really focus on African-centric um, drug discovery. So that's what we've been doing. And importantly, not just as a consequence of being at the University of Cape Town, is to develop talent. This is the journey that we've been on, and this journey has given us a very significant uh, development this year, where this year we were launched as the Johnson & Johnson Satellite Center for Global Health Discovery. This is unprecedented and a significant um, achievement, not just for this country, um, but really for the rest of the continent. And you'll see this on the next slide why this is a really big deal. But the focus of this, and again, I'm very pleased uh, Glenda mentioned the importance of um, AMR. So this is a center that's gonna be focusing on precision antibiotics, looking at those single pathogens that have developed resistance and are responsible for the highest unmet medical need in low to medium income countries, especially those that are responsible for uh, the large number of deaths, both in hospital and community settings. Why is this a big deal? 
this is only one of the three centers worldwide that JNJ has set up. So the first one was launched in London last year. We were launched this year in Cape Town. And the third one was launched at the end of June in, in Singapore. Very significant development, of course, a real stamp of approval for the kind of things that we've done. But importantly, it's building on the partnerships and investments that have taken place before, including investments from the Medical Research Council. So, AMR is not the only thing we do. What this slide is really describing is the other therapeutic areas that we function in. So we work in malaria, TB is a major program of ours, and we also have a COVID grant. The key thing here is that we've developed platforms and technologies that can be repurposed uh, to look at various unmet medical need in different therapeutic areas. And of course, at the top, um, the current funders uh, of our programs ranging from uh, philanthropic institutions, the private sector, industry, and government to high net worth individuals. So Nevo Isdell was the former chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola and gave a very generous donation for some of the work that we're doing today. But that is, Nevo Isdell is not the reason I drink Coke. I've always drunk Coke even before he gave the donation. All right. So the, I've just given you a flavor of conducting research, high level conducting research. What about empowering others to do the same thing? And this is what I'm gonna walk you through now. What do I mean by empowering others? What are the lessons that we've learned from establishing our unit and the center? When I moved to South Africa 26 years ago from America, what I noticed immediately was two extremes. The one extreme is we do wonderful clinical research and clinical trials. The other extreme is we do good basic science. But what lacked was the translational aspects to bridge the gap between the lab and the patient. So the lessons that we've learned in establishing the essential infrastructure, the technologies and the talent is what we'd like to share with other colleagues. This program here has a very long story. In 2017, I was in London at a meeting with the Guest Foundation. And I had a discussion with a program officer there, a colleague and a friend, Peter Warner, together with Tim Wells, uh, who's the Chief Scientific Officer for Medicines for Malaria Venture. And I said to them, I really, really have this vision of seeing how we can expand the community of drug discovery and the ecosystem that we can really share the lessons that we've learned from this program. And of course, the model here that we've used is to execute projects, to build capacity while we're getting the job done. And this is the model that I wanted to, to really, really share with, with the Gates Foundation. And Peter Warner, thankfully, took this forward and really championed this program here. As they say, the rest is history. This is just the program uh, that we started in 2018, uh, which has now been converted into a Grand Challenges program, Grand Challenges Africa program. It's a program that is really, really underpinned by Africa-led innovation. But it's also about working as a community of researchers uh, so we can benefit from the economies of scale. And so what you see is not just the Gates Foundation providing money, but it's also really working with other partners that we can not only, not only contribute to a pipeline of potential future medicines, but also that we can develop talent, that we can develop skills and produce uh, future leaders that are going to lead science forward. This program has unlocked so far more than $2 million, all coming from the Gates Foundation. And the model of this is that our unit is at the core of driving this program, uh, bringing excellence, sharing the infrastructure and the resources that we've developed. But importantly, you see um, that this is not benefiting our unit per se. This is actually benefiting many scientists across the continent. And if you look at the, this is a picture actually, Zoleka is not here, but Zoleka from MRC is in the middle, and uh, Gilbert uh, Mashabela 
is also in the picture, if you can recognize him. Uh, so this was a meeting sometime this year. The tables I've shown you here, the first cohort, um, so each person receives about $100,000 as a seed money to do something that they propose from the home institution and then partner with us for access to things that I've described on the next slide. But you can see uh, the, in the first cohort, there were three South African uh, groups. Nothing to do with me. The second cohort has five South African groups. Okay? Five out of eight um, groups are from South Africa. And really, really benefiting from this consortium and the resources that are coming, not just at the level of funding, but also infrastructure. So this is a Pan-African initiative. But again, the theme of today is about extramural units benefiting research, conducting, empowering, and promoting research in South Africa. You can see, even though this is a Pan-African initiative, the major beneficiaries, majority, is really South Africa. Why? Because of the investments from government, from the MRC and others that have developed the infrastructure that makes people competitive. And so if you're following merit and competitiveness, of course you go for the best proposal. Okay, closer to home. Charity begins at home. And this is really a program we started many years ago with the MRC. Um, and this is really a program, again, very similar concept that I discussed with the Gates Foundation. I went to the then Vice President, Jeff, and said, um, you know, speaking with uh, how can we begin to really, really also use this model locally and begin to develop partnership with historically disadvantaged institutions. And this is a program that thankfully the MRC has been supporting. The first pilot was with Water Solo University in uh, 2018. Um, and the funding, by the way, just to make it clear, the funding doesn't come to us. The funding goes to the institution. But we work with them to develop the proposal, the ideas, and then they submit that proposal for funding. So, for example, you saw that press release last week, a project with the uh, investor of Limpopo that's been awarded already. This slide is a little bit out of date, but this is now investor of Vendor. That proposal has been developed and, of course, is now being considered for funding as well. Again, how are we exactly empowering people in Africa and empowering people in South Africa? And this is really summarized here. This is a busy slide, but I'm really just going to highlight a few points here. We are providing access to the infrastructure that we've developed. This is world-class infrastructure that is not easy to find in many parts of the world, to be honest, not just in Africa. Secondly, mentorship, a very critical component of developing skills is to mentor people. And we have a formal global health mentorship program that Gates Foundation have been supporting. We also provide training, provide avenues for people to spend sabbaticals uh, in Cape Town using the infrastructure, and then providing mentorship. This is an ongoing process. It is really a true partnership, sharing lessons and experiences so people can develop their research infrastructure in their home institution, and we can share the lessons and learnings that we've had um, at the University of Cape Town. The final slide, penultimate point is how have we been able to leverage the investment from the South African Medical Research Council? At the level of the brand, the brand matters. Who you are matters. What people think of you matters. How do we leverage the MRC brand? But also secondly, how do we leverage the MRC investment? And this is really what is summarized here. So when we started, you can see this is a very busy slide, but the message is very, very simple here. So since we got started, this is probably a little bit outdated as well. So we've raised almost actually now in excess of 800 million rands. Out of some of the investments that have come from the MRC, you can see um, government funding, um, SHIP is the Strategic Health Innovation Partnerships Unit of the MRC, together with the Department of Science and Innovation. And then you see multiple partners really investing because they know that we have the backing 
from our government. We have the backing from our institutions. We have the backing from our Medical Research Council. And you can see that we've been able to leverage this to really get significant funding for our programs. What else? This is just a picture. When we started, it was the majority of the funding for, was local. We've shifted this now. Um, about 32% is local. The rest, 60-80%, is international. So this is attracting foreign direct investment on the back of leveraging government funding. And we, this is only just getting better and better. But again, it took that investment from local sources. Science is not always just about delivering products. It's also about using science for development to create jobs. You rarely really succeed and get the solution that you're looking for um, because we know what the nature of research is. That's why it's, it's research. So, but what people don't often appreciate is that while the research is happening, we're creating jobs. We're creating jobs. And so what this slide is telling you is how much we've grown. This is just a center, not even, if I put my academic group in this, it's 95 people working in the same environment, accessing infrastructure that didn't exist before. And so this is job creation. The investment is not just to deliver on the project goals, the scientific project goals, but it's also to create jobs. We can provide hope and inspiration to young people. So have something to aspire to, that you can be a scientist and be an entrepreneur as well. All right, I don't want to bore you with all the details here. Of course, at the end of the day, if I am doing drug discovery, I will be measured, the success of how I'm going to be measured is on what I have discovered, because many things don't actually work. In fact, in this business, we say you have to kiss many frogs before you meet the prince. Um, so a lot of the success you see doesn't become obvious, but it's not about what eventually ends up in the clinic. Of course, that's the ultimate. But in fact, we've also had some success. Uh, we had a compound that we led a team that delivered a compound that went into phase two human trials, um, but also developed other backup uh, molecules that could move forward into clinical studies. Again, showing the track record that we can build the infrastructure, we can develop people, and we can deliver products that really contribute to meeting unmet medical needs. Let me finish off with the final slide, really in terms of the takeaways. Okay, I, I mentioned earlier, the theme of the talk was about conducting research, empowering others to do the research, and promoting it. Promoting it to, in terms of scaling up on the research that we do locally. But these are the takeaways from everything I've been talking about, is really just three things. Firstly, the importance of fostering and incentivizing innovation and entrepreneurship. It is not just about developing IP or products. I showed you the evidence. It's attracting foreign direct investment into the country. It's creating jobs. Those jobs are direct jobs. I'm not even talking about indirect jobs. These are just direct jobs. The business case of this is more than the scientific questions. The business case is also about job creation. Secondly, the role of skilled development, young people, how do we nurture young people? How do we attract them to research and development? How do we attract women to research and development? How do we inspire them? How do we create that capacity to attract them, absorb them, nurture them, develop them, and importantly, retain them? So this is the model that we have here. People need jobs, need the infrastructure, need a reason to stay in the country and not emigrate to Europe. And then finally, it's all about partnerships. Everything we've done is not because of one funder. It's not because of one research partner. All we have done is because of a network of research and funding partners. And I think that is really is my message here. It's all about partnerships. And with partnerships, it's like Liverpool Football Club which is the club that I support. And when you are Liverpool, you will never walk alone. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, Prof. Prof. Kelly Chibale. I wanted to ask that before you sit down, uh, just want to call quickly to the stage, Professor Linda Gray, just to hand over some. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I love gifts. Um, I don't complain. Thank you very much. Especially if they are free. <laughs> don't forget to declare. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Chibale. That was quite a moving presentation. And I think I must say, um, listening to what Prof. Prof. Gray was saying earlier, you know, about some of the lessons learned from the pandemic, I think. Uh, the one thing is clear, because when I listen to you as well, um, is that one thing that we took away from the pandemic is that there, there is a need to, to really invest, invest in, in research uh, uh, development in the country and innovation. So I think thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm going to call upon, I think this is the most important part of the program, we're going to call upon the four uh, new unit directors just to come and give us you know, just a bit of an overview of what the uh, uh, sorry, of what their units are essentially about, and um, uh, upon doing that, I think I need to make you aware of a few changes to our program. Not that much. Uh, you would you would have noticed that on the item number, I think it's number four, that was meant to be done by the Director General of the Department of Health, Dr. Sandile Puchelezi. We now have Dr. Lin Muyeng Matlangu is going to be representing the TG in that item. That is the one change. And then the one other change is on the official launch of the four UDs. Uh, so initially we we're going to have the minister or deputy minister coming to do the launch. But we will be playing a video from the deputy minister in that item. So the video is there that was, that was sent to us by the department. Um, to officially launch the, the, the four unit, you, 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 uh, extramural research units. So, uh, to start off the presentations, I'm going to call upon Professor Nancy, Professor Nancy uh, Paswana Mafuya, to come and give us just a bit of an overview of what her unit is going to be all about. Professor Rafila, welcome. Good morning, and thank you very much, MC. Uh, Prof. Tlender, you said I like stealing the show. You must blame Prof. Lizelle for that. <laughs> she said I should make sure I dress for the occasion, and I've, I think I've done that. Um, all protocol observed, it is my distinct honor uh, and privilege to address this distinguished audience about PESA, the Pan-African Center for Epidemics Research, on Women's Month. I could not have celebrated the Women's Month in any better way than this. It is a privilege to be afforded the opportunity to serve uh, as the founding director uh, of a prestigious unit, an SAMRC unit. You've seen the work that was displayed here, and that's where we are going. Uh, and to lead the first ever SAMRC extramural unit at the University of Johannesburg, and I'm very glad my bosses are here. Uh, they have been very supportive towards this endeavor, the DVC research and internalization, and my executive team taking a corner right there, and the rest of the PESA team. Halala, PESA, halala. <laughs> Evidencing the extraordinary team effort, visionary leadership, and institutional supports it took to establish PESA come to fruition today, make this momentous occasion both exciting and very humbling, I must say. This event is also a great send-off to Ghana. Uh, and I'm glad Dr. Mungez is here, and Dr. Edith Palani, and the rest of the delegation that the dean has put aside at the University of Johannesburg that's coming with to Ghana. So I'm quite excited that tomorrow I will be coordinated as the queen of research, and then today I'm at this momentous occasion. I feel like a celebrity. Um, let me 
I am a celebrity, hello. <laughs> Let me run through PESA uh, work due to the limitedness of time. Since April 1, PESA hit the ground running with its timely research agenda, long-standing collaborations, strong capacity building focus, and transformative approach, as well as grant application efforts to ensure its long-term sustainability. PESA seeks to conduct high-quality, innovative, and ambitious research that is globally competitive, locally responsive, and contextually relevant on pandemics to impact policy and practice. When COVID-19 hit, the world, including South Africa, was not adequately prepared. Um, and this was compounded and confounded by a long history of gross inequalities and inequities in health that make pandemics thrive, as you know. So empiricism, new methods, new approaches, new techniques and technologies are quite critical in handling pandemics. South Africa needs an in-depth understanding, just like any other country, of local epidemics in the context of persistent health disparities and competing health risks that worsen disease, acquisition, transmission, severity, and including uh, death. So, we have seen with H1N1, HIV, uh, TB, and recently with COVID-19 that the context is quite key in addressing local pandemics. The know your epidemic, know your response uh, for HIV is very much applicable to current uh, pandemics and to the future ones. We need to clearly articulate the shared determinants of epidemics downstream and, out and upstream factors, including living and working conditions, risk heterogeneities, differential impacts, and subpopulations that are most affected, among others, for targeted, sustainable, effective, and efficient, efficient responses that will help us not to have history repeat itself. We cannot afford to lose as many lives again. We know that pandemics come and pandemics, pandemics go. So COVID-19 is not the last epidemic. Current epidemics are not the last uh, pandemics. Therefore, we are wanting to prepare ourselves in such a manner that we are uh, having targeted responses in a time of financial austerity uh, in such a manner that we will have greater impacts on health outcomes and improved quality of life of majority of South Africans, especially the marginalized, underserved, under-researched population in a country that bears a quadruple burden of disease. PESA was conceived to do cutting-edge epidemiological and public health uh, research uh, on local epidemics for an equitable, sustained, and tailored uh, response and for future pandemic preparedness and thanks you put it so well uh, Prof Lenda to guide new models of health care, strengthen health systems, health service delivery, national strategic plans, mitigate the direct and indirect impacts of pandemics and eventually save lives and improve quality of lives, especially among women who are mostly vulnerable due to their appalling living and working conditions. This is very much aligned to the SAMRC vision of building a healthy nation through research, innovation, and transformation. I'm gonna run through uh, the projects that we are currently doing. Uh, we're running the Boloka project, uh, funded by the SAMRC, uh, and we recently uh, acquired an NIH grant, which is being finalized. Uh, focusing on leveraging data science and 4IR uh, methods to harness and amass big heterogeneous HIV key populations data, including large underutilized data sets to evaluate the potential impact of HIV responses among high risk populations that uh, uh, acquire uh, HIV and transmit HIV far more than the general population. In this regard, we are building a data warehouse which will be patented. Uh, we intend utilizing 
uh, this data to better the treatment cascade, HIV treatment cascade. We didn't do well in terms of global targets, 1990, and now we are striving towards the 1995, 1995, 1995 targets, and we are aiming to uh, end HIV as an epidemic or to, to attain epidemic control by 2030. And we are looking to do small area estimations where data are lacking so that we analyze data even at granular levels. We're aiming to model impacts of pandemics on high-risk populations to inform policy and programs. We're aiming to address individual needs of different categories of population living with HIV and address gaps in HIV responses. And we've got the Lukishang project, uh, also supported by the, by the SAMRC capacity development program. And we have sought additional uh, funding from the IDRC to expand this work. And this involves evaluating routinely collected program data to characterize and quantify the magnitude of COVID-19 impacts on HIV program indicators, including HIV testing, yield, ART initiation, PrEP initiation, among others. I can go on PMT, CT, SRH, and so on over time, comparing the pre and the peri uh, COVID-19 periods using uh, complex analytical uh, uh, tools and methods such as time-based series analysis, uh, difference in difference analysis, and so on to determine changes in uh, services or in those who took services uh, or who remained in HIV care compared to those uh, that uh, did not remain in care and why, why that happened and what is it that needs to be done. We seek to assess trends and patterns and again to inform tailoring and adaptation of implementation strategies for strengthening delivery of HIV prevention and treatment services among vulnerable population. And uh, the last project that I'll give as an example is the Ahanang project funded by the UJ Global Excellence Data 4.2 which involves assessing trends and patterns of COVID-19 vaccine coverage and characteristics of vaccinated individuals since the beginning of the vaccination program to determine vaccine equity and inequities, determining also the association between COVID-19 vaccine status, impacts and adverse events among South African using the electronic vaccination data system, our world in data, WHO dashboard, Africa CDC data, and other open access data sets. In terms of modus operandi, PESA is forging collaborations. When you were making your presentation, it was like you've seen my script, because having been a director of a research unit for 13 years, very successful, impactful, there is the deputy CEO of the HSRC will tell you, when I was at the HSRC for 13 years, I know for a fact that if you want to multiply the, the impact of your work, you need to collaborate. You, if you want multiple perspective uh, and greater impact, you can't do it alone. So we at uh, PESA, we forge collaborations, cooperations, partnerships, and alliance for cross-fertilization of best practices in tackling current pandemics and future pandemic preparedness. No single institution uh, or perspective is adequate enough to address pandemics. Thus, PESA adopts uh, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approaches and multisectoral approaches, including four IR technologies and innovation. As you know, our institution is well known for this. So we are leveraging those technologies to visualize our data, to store our data, and to uh, make sure that we come up with as many innovations as possible. For example, in terms of uh, collaborations. In this room today, we have uh, two graduate students uh, from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, Haley and Katie. You may say hi to everybody who are visiting us for four months. Yes, let's clap for them. Uh, they are graduate students from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health visiting us for four months working with us on collaborative uh, project. And Emory University, one of our collaborators, is in the process of pairing our 15 MPH students 
with uh, their counterparts at Emerald in order to enhance uh, scholarship, uh, co-publications, and what have you. So uh, in May this year, we already hosted Emerald and Johns Hopkins University to collaboratively discuss uh, PACER plans. And in terms of South-South uh, 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 collaborations, we have collaborations with Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kisum, not Kisum, uh, 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 Kumasi, Ghana, and the Pan-African University of Life and Earth Sciences in Nigeria, University of Ibadan. So from here, I'll be meeting our co collaborators also uh, in Ghana together with the Ghana AIDS Commission. So collaboration is very, very key. Not only that, we also have internal collaboration. I've alluded to our data science colleagues. I've alluded to uh, 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 the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics, and the Department of Statistics are also part of the collaborations. So PACER clearly conducts it, its work uh, in a collaborative fashion. As I uh, bring my uh, brief overview, um, to a close, I want to also say that PESA collaborates with historically disadvantaged institutions, including University of Mpumalanga and UNIVEN on some of the listed projects here. Uh, my colleague here, who, who also is uh, being uh, recognized today, knows the kind of conversations we've had. So PESA is dynamically shaping the future. This is UJ's vision through increasing capacities in handling pandemics. When the history of South Africa and Africa research capacity development is written, the name of PESA should feature prominently as one of the EMUs that made a decisive difference in developing a critical mass of diverse skilled public health researchers so that we facilitate scholarship, and I'll try not to repeat what we have said, internships, mentorships, uh, pathway. Um, PESA Liver Academic Accelerated Mentorship Program, the Division for Academic Planning, Quality Promotion, and Academic Staff Development, the Future Professors Program, which is a national initiative that is based at UJ, are all, you know, amassing their forces about them, but it is because, Prof. Lenda, you don't know what happened behind the scenes. It was 11.15, showed us the time. Yeah, that's the type of dedication and hard work and support that one had to get. I must say, having been DVC, you know, and having been a, a, a research director or a unit director, I am humbled and I am privileged to serve PESA to date it's just beginning. The best is yet to come. Thank you, MRC, for affording us the opportunity. Can I ask the PESA team members that are here to stand? You'll understand the reason why. They are not all here, but they um, <clears throat> if you If you look at the, and the pathogen priority list of, and the bacteria which are listed by the WHO, now, that is a list, but we don't expect that list to stay constant. And that is the way, speaking to what Nancy was saying, not so, things change. So how do you begin and to revise that list that suits your own, your own environment in the first place? And how do you advance that? How do you inform that list? It's revision and the type of pathogens that you want to pay attention to as time goes on. Now, and to have that down, one part is also missing is that you need large data sets and data sets that are collected as a cross-sectional stuff have a lot of limitation. You need to have things that are actually in a prospective manner from a starting point perhaps and go a year or two and three and follow up individuals and see the dynamics in terms of what they have, what type of pathogen they harbor in terms of resistant profiles, where are they getting this from? How do they transmit it to others? All those are things that have to be packaged and to have a solid, a solid intervention. Which means you must work with the community. So one of the things that we would like to be doing is how do we bring the community in, in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? What is their role? 
And do we stay in the lab and manipulate the microorganisms and see what they have and describe? And then we fold our arms. But we think that the community also needs to be aware, the first thing, and also get educated as we also educate ourselves from a scientific perspective. But how do they get aware? How do they get activated? Uh, I would say aware and become educated in that, which means they should be part of that process in terms of a participatory approach. And so to mobilize the community, you engage them and get them involved in a way when you develop packages of community awareness, they have been part of that process and they inform what type of package they like to see that is speaking to their own needs. And this also speaks very well in terms of the University of Venda, I would say slogan, research for impact, engage scholarship. So that is one area which the unit is going to be driving. How does a community play a role in mitigating the effects of antimicrobial resistance? Now, just a little bit of, of what I've been doing in the past. When people mention HIV year, and we talk about the 95, 95, 95 goals of the UNAIDS by 2030. As you all know, it's been shown that treatment is prevention for HIV. But we also know that as we, at this time, we can cure HIV. And our data, and that from others, has shown that drug resistance may be one of the key, the, the key barriers to achieve the 1095 which is to have all those who are on treatment to have a sustained viral load. But we have also seen a, a, in our own study that exposure to antiretrovirals is not only when you are on treatment, but there are different other avenues that people are getting exposed to antiretrovirals. And we are asking ourselves, how does that inform outcome in treatment in our communities? Of course, there are issues about and psychosocial factors that play a role in terms of adherence, and such that you limit HIV drug resistance to the barest minimum and get the most out of the regimen, which are also changing. And as a change, you also need to be coming forth with data to inform that change or to maintain that change as time goes on. So this is very, very important for us. And the second thing is, um, in the work that we did, where well, that took about three or four years, it was very interesting to note that children who were born as young as four months old harbor broad spectrum antimicrobial bacteria who have not been exposed to any antibiotics. Where are they getting it from? So in essence, what is the burden of antibiotic resistance in our populations. If we don't have that data, it could be difficult and to really inform an antibiotic stewardship program because there is a gap. And many times we see outbreaks of resistance in a clinical setting. But this book comes to the clinics from a community. What do we have in the community? What do we know about the community? Of course, the community is also very dynamic and the environment also changes in terms of and the contact with animals, which at times have been grown or maintained on antibiotics. How does that come in? In the households, what happens there? When people take medicine, how do they use it? And do they use it all? What are the human factors that influence that? So in essence, our mission is central to the fact that we want to get the communities involved, and these communities are diverse on how you manage antimicrobial resistance. On the aspect of HIV, as we all know, again, that is also very important, and the psychosocial determinants that influence drug resistance development in HIV. How do you get that in place? And the previous speakers have mentioned issues of partnerships, of training, and capacity development. I don't want to go into that. But the whole idea is that at the end of the day, 
and the unit stands to be a reference point for AMR epidemiology. And in the sense that it commands a leadership in that regard. And the leadership will cut across, as you all know, all these different aspects. In terms of the science, in terms of, the, of, uh, of developing the human capital, in terms of growing the network, bringing in new ideas, and new issues, and things that come up, how do you address that? And of course, making sure that we use the most appropriate technologies to provide data that is really reliable, that and someone can use and make predictions. So, one of the other things that I think we all know, I mean, um, issues of wastewater, which may serve as a proxy and to have an understanding of what we find in the communities in terms of what is being shared around of antimicrobial resistance. So all that forms part of our starting, you know, which we started a few years back. And that is why, Glenda, our application was like a package of what we have been doing and where we want to take it going forward and how we bring in the communities to bear on the data that we find. I was happy to hear you talk about the AMR, you know, and the other issues, and my mind is beginning to flash and thinking what the networks, what the collaborations coming to add to what we already have. And that is something which we shall be looking forward as well. Um, um, we've received, well, you mentioned the issue of, of say, having leverage, which is quite, it's quite telling, because as soon as the MRC announced that Univen we have this unit. Are we receiving emails and calls? So the MRC is very powerful. <laughs> it's very powerful and highly respected, you know. Those are the indicators. Yeah, you guys are working on this. Hey, where can we meet? Can we talk about this? We are doing this. We can come together. And that is very, very encouraging. So the whole idea is that you have also made us where to be visible in terms of the expertise at the University of Venda, and how others can also leverage on that expertise. And we are very proud of that. And to thank the MRC for giving us that recognition that you can contribute to the objectives of the MRC, which is a statutory body, you know, and to do research to impact on health of everyone who lives around here and beyond. So, uh, well, with that, I'm going to end, and uh, I've, I've taken notes of where my next stop would be in terms of collaborations. Uh, we've spoken already with Nancy in the past, in the past two or three weeks or so. Uh, you spoke to others in different universities, as well as outside South Africa, and we hope that uh, we are looking for very great things to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, uh, when, you, when you mentioned that you already know your next stop, and then immediately I knew that we have achieved our mission, because one of our missions is to really create a platform for, for partnerships and collaboration to thrive. And I'm happy that within this room, you know, a small group as we are already, people have had conversations on the sidelines, there's already opportunities for collaboration. It means we are definitely getting somewhere. And I mean, uh, when you mentioned, when you're emphasizing the issue of involving the community in, in what you do from the beginning to the end, uh, I was tempted to scream then and say, some track, some work. <laughs> because uh, I mean, I can only imagine that it's research for the community with the involvement of the community. So thank you so much for that. And I think it, it, it's something that most of us may might, might, might want to take you know, home to say, in whatever that we do, we should always be in a position to involve the community from the ground up. Um, we're going to call upon, uh, uh, and I think also when you mentioned, and I think this, this kept on coming from, I think two, three speakers now, we mentioned the strength of the brand, brand SMRC. And when you said immediately after you got the email and you started getting calls, you're like, okay, this brand, and I'm, and I'm coming from, <laughs> from the, the corporate communications, that is you know, the custodian of the brand. I, and I must say, uh, clearly we are doing something right. But I must also say, uh, part of the reason why we are a strong brand as the SMRC is really 
not because of our own doing. And I think it's really mostly about the, the caliber of scientists, the caliber of researchers that we associate with, even outside the SMRC. You know, and, and this is what I always say to Prof when we ever we're having our sideline talks, I'm like, Prof, and I always wonder if, 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 if the, these, these researchers and scientists really know how big they are, you know? And I get this a lot whenever I interact, whenever we're doing press release or we're doing a story on it, and I got these guys, I don't think they know how big they are. And I understand why, because I think for them it's really about just getting the work done. It's just doing the work. I don't think they really get to understand how big they are in South Africa and outside. But I mean, uh, and, 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 and for me, hence I'm saying, our association with the caliber of such scientists is what really makes Brand SMRC one that needs no introduction anymore. You know, and I must say also, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we've always been, we, we've been um, able to, to take advantage of the pandemic to grow the brand. Because I mean, we, we've forever been, you know, in the forefront of the fight against COVID-19. At some point, we almost became the face of vaccination in the country, you know? So I think also that even people who may not have known about SMRC before the pandemic, I'm sure by now they know what the SMRC is all about. And thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to call upon Professor uh, Colette Dandara from the University of Cape Town to also come and give us an overview of his unit. But I'm sure, I mean, uh, if you look at the booklet that you have, there is, you know, I think on the second page, in fact, under every unit, there's sort of an overview of the unit. But I mean, they have an opportunity now to sort of, you know, elaborate a bit on that. Professor, the stage is yours. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much and uh, greetings. Um, I will give um, uh, a presentation, but first I just want to um, <clears throat> uh, uh, greet you from uh, the cold Cape Town. It's, it's very cold these days. But I really want to appreciate the following people and organizations. First, I want to appreciate my own leadership from UCT, uh, Professor Sue Harrison. I, I think they, I, I've heard from uh, the previous speakers uh, speaking about how wonderful uh, their DVCs were. And I can just share one epitaph where uh, Sue was somewhere between Chicago and somewhere uh, going somewhere. She had to find Wi-Fi so that she could sign one of my documents. So this is the, uh, how amazing some of the people we are working with. I also want to really acknowledge uh, my colleagues from UCT here, uh, Prof Chibale. Uh, th thank you for your always inspiring talks. And my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Professor Ndusi, who is also coming to speak here. Uh, I would also want to acknowledge the MRC leadership, um, <clears throat> uh, particularly um, uh, President um, Glenda Gray, uh, the VP Elizu, who is also in, uh, uh, my previous leader, also at the faculty, um, really um, I acknowledge the, the work that you do. And I would really want to bring attention also to uh, colleagues. There are two colleagues who I've uh, come to know through the MRC board. The, this is Professor Shea and Professor Kenge. The way I've known them is that these unity directors are inspiring. They are very, very productive. I would urge people who are doing research to just go and look at their units. And with that, I've been very much inspired by the work they do and the way they publish their work and the influence that they, they have in terms of the work they are working on. Um, <clears throat> unity directors, I really acknowledge you. We hope one day we can be like you. <clears throat> um, I would also want to acknowledge uh, fellow board members who are present um, uh, on this occasion. Last but not least, I really want to acknowledge my team. Uh, all this unit is made up of people. First, I want to acknowledge um, the deputy director for the unit. When we applied, we purposely decided in the beginning that we will need a deputy director. And we've got already a succession plan, but we're starting this unit now. So Professor Pumla Ndadi is, is the deputy director. She couldn't come because of uh, flights and all that. And I've got uh, various uh, co-investigators that you see on the presentation. And what makes this also unit tick are the students. Uh, that we work with. And with that, uh, really, I would want to, um, to thank the MRC uh, administrators for organizing this event. And I would want now to focus and just give you snippets of the, uh, our unit. Thank you. <clears throat> I 
I assure you I will be, I will be short, but I'll be more than five minutes, but less than 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. So if you, if you look, uh, th that is our, our platform. We are, we are so excited to be recognized by the, the, the MRC. This has been a journey. When I started academia in 2009, my first grant was the uh, self-initiated research grant. And it has now landed me to this. I think um, I'm not a Liverpool supporter. However, I can borrow your line in terms of the MRC and, and, and my journey in terms of this research. So I really appreciate what the MRC has done to us. But I want to situate uh, the area that we work in in terms of health. If you look in terms of health intervention broadly, I know I'm speaking to the converted, there are two major uh, categories where you're looking at prevention, and then if you fail to prevent it, then you have to treat it. And then in prevention, you want to stop disease, you want to reduce disease, while it's in, in, in now treatment therapeutics, you want to either treat or to, re, to postpone the effects of this disease. Pharmacogenomics plays a role largely in, under the therapeutics. Of course, we're starting to also see a lot of uh, role that it plays in, in, in prevention. If you look in, in terms of vaccines also, pharmacogenomics is starting also to play a role. Um, let me, I'm trying to learn which one to, yes, okay. So if you see, when we talk about pharmacogenomics, we are looking at how one's genetic information can be used to decide on the choice of a drug, the dose that the drug, uh, the, the dose that is going to be given, and the duration of that treatment, and in that also we must remember that once inherited genetics can affect whether a bad reaction, uh, they will have a bad reaction to a drug, or whether they, uh, a drug will help them. I'm simplifying the, the, these terms, or whether a drug will not have any effect. Um, if, if you look at the current treatment approach, looking at the clinical uh, parameters, demographics, and all that, it does not recognize that patients do come with, uh, even though they are presenting with the same conditions, they can actually have different underlying genetic makeup. But what is picked at the end is differential responses. Then we start to worry to say, why are certain patients responding well, others are not responding well? We are trying to bring in a, um, another um, a tool in the kit that can help us identify before we give the drug who is likely to, be, uh, to benefit from this drug and who is likely to suffer toxic effects so that at least we target the drug to the right patient and uh, uh, at the right amount. If you look here, what I'm representing, don't worry about uh, too much of the figures. What I've done is that on the left here, these are uh, world populations, yes, you know them. The, the, the red blocks, uh, block is uh, showing populations that are of African ancestry. Those on top are other um, uh, populations from out, out of Africa. What you can see clearly is that, um, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to, to get a, uh, let, me, let me leave that. What you, get, you can see clearly is that if you look at one of the major enzymes that metabolizes drugs that we take, which we call CYP2D6, you will see that on star 17 up under there, the, this is a variant that affects most of the drugs that are given for, let's say, depression, uh, and arrhythmias, and all that. You will find that that variant, you don't find it in, um, in, in European population, in, in European and population that are not of African origin. However, look at the frequency of that variant in African population. I'm just pointing out one variant. But what this means is that one drug that is produced in a particular part of the world does not work the same across the world. And people will ask, why do we need pharmacogenomics when people at Harvard are doing pharmacogenomics? Because we have got particular populations that are not being studied. So we are very relevant in terms of looking at pharmacogenomics. I will simplify it now in terms of this enzyme that I've spoken about, CYP2D6. It's a very important enzyme because it metabolizes drugs that have got narrow therapeutic index. You, for dosing, if you just give a little bit more, you're in the toxic range. If you give a, bit, a little bit less, you're uh, under dosing. So what happens is that this enzyme, the gene that causes it is what, what we call genetic polymorphisms. But what these genetic polymorphisms do is I've summarized them. It has got copy number variations. Some people have got up to 13 copies of this gene. Some people have got zero. It's deleted. 
So among us here, if you're a dear, test, you can find actually some way of 18 copies and all. Now imagine when you are giving a standard dose of a drug to one with the 13 copies and one with zero copies. Of course, the outcome is different. But you can only know that if you have characterized these people. So, so the variation in these genes that cause uh, that metabolized drug can either result in increased activity, no activity, or reduced activity. I will just give you an example of a drug, um, no, triptyline. If you look at the copy numbers that I was talking about in CYP2D6, the, the top graph, if you give uh, 25 milligrams of uh, no, triptyline three times per day, you will find that those who have got one, a zero and one copy actually get into the therapeutic index. However, those with two to 13 copies, it's not enough. If you go down to the next, if you ramp up your, 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 your dose, now those who have got zero and one are now in the toxic range. They are already starting to do hallucinations and everything. Why at least now those with two, three to four are now in the um, uh, therapeutic range? However, even if you ramp this dose to 75 milligrams a meal, those with 13 coffee, copies never benefit from this drug. Pharmacogenomics tells us then they don't need to be given the, uh, this drug. We need to use an alternative drug. So this is just to show you the, 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 the uh, uh, premising where our unit is, uh, is. So the problem that we are trying to solve is that uh, we, in terms of therapeutics, drugs don't work all the time. And, 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 and we know, and it's more so, especially in chemotherapeutics. We, we have not found uh, better drugs. We have found better drugs for very small uh, families of cancer. But the, on the larger uh, aspects, we haven't. So what we, 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 we vision to do is that we want uh, to be able to contribute uh, to a situation where we can derive maximum benefit from existing and future drugs through pharmacogenomics research and translation. But we can achieve this through establishing an ultra-modem integrated center whose research spans from mechanistic to mild-omic approaches to elucidate genetic contributions to drug response. And we, we, we want really to enhance, because pharmacogenomics is the, is the core of precision medicine. So we want to bring this um, and it can only be done in multidisciplinary teams. You will see uh, what we have put uh, together as part of our team. So our objectives, of course, we, are to, we want to build capacity in, in pharmacogenomics research and translation. What we have already done is that we have created a an African pharmacogenomics network. We know we cannot do it alone in, in South Africa, so we are now working with other people outside of South Africa. We want to uh, uh, develop protocols and SOPs to help people who want to get into pharmacogenomics research so that they can um, uh, carry, uh, do their work well. We want also to come up with best practices and the recommendations for drugs that we currently use in, in, in South Africa to say what should be um, uh, the, the recommendation in terms of their use. And then we also want to, as part of that a package, to train, we'll be training students. Um, just hanging on to what um, uh, Prof. Chibale uh, has been talking about. So I will, I'm not going to go through the, the whole, um, <clears throat> but what I want to show you is that uh, we're we, we starting uh, uh, our unit with a focus at Krotoski Hospital, where we are looking at the various clinics there. We have already uh, had uh, what we call a physician advocates who are willing to be part of this uh, unit. And then there are several uh, focus areas that we will use in terms of um, uh, delivering on our, on our vision. But the capacity development, advocacy will be central to achieving uh, our goals. So I just want to share with you one of the uh, research that we've done. Um, one of the uh, major drugs in, in, in HIV was efavirenz. Um, for a long time, the standard dose has been um, uh, 600 milligrams a meal. And what has always been observed is that some individuals develop side effects. It is actually the phenomenon that you are seeing on the left there that a mutation was discovered in one of the enzymes that metabolizes the uh, favorins. And people who carry the mutation at the far end were not able to uh, break down the favorins. So when they get the next dose, they still have a lot of the previous dose in their system. So they were pushed into the toxic effects. So they will start to develop rashes, hallucinations. And what simply people did was they would just uh, stop taking the drug if they want to go to, uh, to some function. 
and then they come. But that's a problem for uh, resistance, as the previous speaker uh, spoken about. So what we did then is that we developed what we call a gene dosifavrins. Actually, my team, uh, um, we, we were part of a, a team that won the um, Houghton Innovation Prize. We won the first prize. Coming from Cape Town, they allowed us to compete. We got uh, 500,000 to develop what we call Jindos. And uh, unfortunately, when uh, we were able to, to show that you can actually um, have a gene-based dosing, Favorins was slowly being taken out of the system. Now we have got DTG. But this really shows that actually you can actually use pharmacogenomics to tailor medication. And this um, uh, work is now being done at the Innovation Hub in Pretoria. There's a group that has taken over uh, doing this work. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of that. Many people complain that pharmacogenomics or genetics is expensive. But we would want to, uh, to propose that um, from a workflow that was recently proposed by uh, uh, Giri, that we, we can do it like what we do with our IDs, our driver's license. That it, uh, for every patient, they are first encounter with, uh, with therapeutics. If a blood sample is taken, and, they, and, and they, it, their genetic makeup characterized. That's all you need, and it's done once. The next time you come to the hospital, we are now, we already have your information. We are now able to call on your results so that they can be useful. But every time you come, let's say you, you use your results three, four times, every time you are using those results, actually you are making the characterization cheaper and cheaper. And now to just uh, um, comment on the unit. So currently um, we have got a, a unit that is made up of uh, colleagues from uh, lipidology, uh, clinical pharmacology, uh, the hypertension clinic. Um, the, 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 the ones in uh, 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 orange there, in, in yellow there, we, 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 uh, we still um, um, negotiating on the, on, the, on the collaboration, but all the other ones uh, we have already uh, agreed on the on the collaboration. So this is uh, we are fascinated by the the work that we 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 we're doing, and we hope that with this funding from the MRC, we, we 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 will be put in a position to apply for further funding from international bodies. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we want you to go to your physician so that you can be treated not as an average but as an individual. <clears throat> so with that. I really would want to <clears throat> thank the MRC and um, my collaborators and my students and all of you. For the, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I, I have just, uh, you know, gathered some intelligence from, from the leadership. Uh, we, we all know by now that Professor Rifilwe uh, Nancy has to quickly jet to Ghana. And you were thinking maybe, uh, Prof. Ntusi, if you don't mind, we're just going to slightly deviate from the program. I'm going to call upon Professor Rifilwe uh, to come on stage so that Professor Glenda Gray and Professor Liesel can just hand over the placard to the unit. And then so we can allow you to, to quickly jet off. And I think the last time I checked, flying to Ghana was about six hours, it's six hours or so. If you're going straight, if you're not connecting Ethiopia or Kenya, it could be no. <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe let's allow her to. Um, I think the pacer. Thank you so much. Uh, have a safe trip, Prof. Nancy. Enjoy Ghana and represent as well. You've already done that. So I think we can now go back to, to our program. 
and um, we are slowly getting towards the end of our program. So I'm going to call upon Professor Ntobe Kondusi from the University of Cape Town to also come and give us a brief overview. Thank you so much, Prof. Glenda, Liesl, esteemed colleagues and friends, it's a singular privilege for me to stand in front of you with a sense of immense gratitude, pride, and humility at the launch of our research unit on the intersection of NCDs and infections. Many of you will know that uh, non-communicable diseases and infections often coexist and manifest in intricate additive and bidirectional fashions in the same individual. For instance, if you look at new onset diabetes or new onset heart failure or hypertension in those uh, with COVID-19, it's much more common, but also those with NCDs who get COVID-19 get much more severe disease. For a long time, we've known that if you have HIV, your risk of getting tuberculosis is much higher. And if you get antiretroviral therapy to treat your HIV, your risk of getting TB is substantially reduced. But the use of these drugs substantially increase the risk of subsequent cardiovascular disease as a consequence of chronic immune activation, diastolic, mitochondrial, and um, uh, endothelial dysfunction, uh, as well as impaired uh, lipid uh, profiles. Similarly, patients with many NCDs are more prone to develop mental health issues. Infections are a key driver of mental health disease. And I would postulate that for a long time, the way in which we have approached our understanding of the nexus of infections and NCDs has been very siloed. Um, and our hypothesis for some time now has been that in order to have an improved understanding of the management of that intersection of infections and NCDs, we need to have um, a systematic approach that um, will allow us uh, not only to better understand mechanisms of disease, but ultimately to lead to better management of individuals that suffer from both of these, particularly for those in low and middle income countries. There are currently limited data, particularly in our regions of the world on mechanisms of disease, natural history, optimal management approaches, and outcomes in those with NCDs who get subsequent infections, or those with infections that end up getting NCDs. There's also a limited capacity to study the interaction of these two due to the siloed approaches of our research and clinical practice. And so through this proposed research program of our EMU, we hope that we will uh, drive a new area of scholarship, generate new knowledge, as well as a new generation of scientists and clinicians who will contribute substantially to improved understanding of this complex interaction, but ultimately to lead to the improvement of health for those who suffer from these important public health conditions. So our proposed uh, EMU, um, as you will see in the program, uh, has a, already an established uh, record of scholarship uh, in this area. But it's my excitement that uh, it brings uh, together many new scientists um, from uh, imaging to 
basic science and immunology to public health, um, clinical disciplines, and uh, my hope is that um, it will give us uh, the ability to leverage all of this expertise uh, and to have much greater impact in terms of the work that we do. In launching uh, this uh, research unit, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the outstanding contributions uh, to our work from our students uh, and our collaborators and the staff members of our unit, uh, many of whom are joining online. And in addition, I wish to acknowledge the outstanding support uh, from the research office at the University of Cape Town in our faculty as well as the center, and uh, particularly wish to acknowledge uh, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, um, Sue, as well as uh, Linda, uh, our Director for Research, who have been extraordinarily supportive, and I look forward uh, to continuing um, to work closely with them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Antusi. Um, I think we are, we are pretty much back on track. You know, whenever I, I, I get to, to MC such programs, there's a time where you are late in the program and somewhere there you are back on track. And the next thing you know it, you are running late. But at least now I can safely say we are pretty much back on time. And um, uh, with that said, I'm going to call upon uh, Dr. Dr. Lin Muyeng Matlangu who is the, the Chief Director of Health Promotion, Nutrition and Oral Health from the Department of Health, to just come and uh, you know, briefly uh, give us a word or two. Uh, she will be representing the Director General, Dr. Sandile uh, Butelezi. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, Program Director, Professor Glenda Gray, members of the academic community, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> when I was sitting there, I actually had some mixed emotions. Reading someone else's speech can be daunting, but I was also glad that if I say anything that may not be appreciated, it's not me. <laughs> But I'm also glad that I was requested to come and read the speech because I learned so much from the presenters. Now, going back to being the Director General, I'm pleased to address this important occasion for launching the four extramural units within the South African Medical Research Council. I was, briefly, I was requested to briefly talk to MRC, Extramural Research Unit, in the broader context of research and innovation in South Africa. We're excited and very proud of the work that uh, MRC and EMUs are doing. The quality of work is recognized globally and has been highlighted during the battle against COVID-19. The South African scientists rose to the challenge of COVID-19 and its complexity during a critical time when there, is great, when there was great uncertainty and fear. The visit by the US State Secretary General, Mr. Anthony Blinken, on South African Women's Day is another significant gesture to recognize SAMRC and affiliated research scientists. We are grateful to the MRC team under the leadership of Professor Glenda Gray, who provided the first COVID-19 vaccine to our healthcare workers through the Sisonke program. They demonstrated the value of scientific research in providing real-time needed solutions. We welcome the new EMU directors who have no doubt 
they will assist us in providing evidence that provides solutions for health challenges. The challenges for the health sector remains as articulated in the National Service Delivery Agreement, the NSDA 2010, as complex quadruple burden of disease, which consists of communicable diseases such as HIV and HIV and AIDS and TB, as well as a rise in non-communicable diseases. The associated mortality is compounded by a high maternal mortality ratio, child mortality rates, as well as high rates of violence, injury, and trauma. Serious concerns exist about the quality of public health care, ineffective and inefficient health system, and the spiraling private health care costs. Furthermore, COVID-19 has also reduced the life expectancy due to increased number of deaths among almost two decades of positive growth following the implementation of the ART program nationally. Disease pandemics remain a threat in the future. That is why we are busy with pandemic preparedness to be equipped for better response. We have a mammoth task of bringing about better health outcomes post COVID-19, knowing very well that the living conditions exacerbated by worsened economic situation, unemployment, and inequality has worsened in the past two years. We need to focus more than ever in ensuring that the National Development Plan Vision 2030 for the health sector is realized, namely a life expectancy rate of at least 70 years for men and women, a generation of under 20s largely free of HIV, a reduced quadruple burden of disease, an infant mortality rate of less than 20 deaths per thousand live births, and under five mortality rate of less than 30 per thousand live births. A significant shift in equity, efficiency, effectiveness, and quality of healthcare provision, and universal coverage and a significant reduction in the risk by the social determinants of disease and adverse ecological factors. NHI is our vehicle for transformation of the health system to deliver universal coverage. It requires the whole of government and society approach that we have experienced and seen modeled during the fight against COVID-19. As we recover from COVID-19 pandemic, we need to deal with the setbacks, leverage the gains made, and move forward with health priorities. The pandemic had resulted in diversion of health system resources, outstretched health systems, especially human resources, disrupted health services, worsened the state of non-communicable diseases, including mental health, uh, and, and exacerbated existing inequalities and poverty. The WHO has proposed four-pronged approach to reset the health system as we recover from COVID-19. These include recalibration to ensure post-COVID needs assessment, comprehensive recovery plan, resources and policy alignment. The second is the mitigation to accelerate and scale up the COVID-19 vaccination. Resurgence monitoring and essential services catch up. The third point is about the integration and institutionalization of COVID-19 management into existing immunization programs service delivery and health systems, including data and surveillance system. And lastly, the recovery and reprioritization of health systems, health system and key initiatives to enhance HRH capacity and scale up digital health. 
it is now widely recognized that uh, ecological determinants of health, including emergent zoonotic pathogens and climate change related environmental factors must be integrated into future health research priorities. Health priorities will not be achieved unless health research start producing relevant evidence for cost-effective health technologies, such as new and improved drugs, vaccines, diagnostic tests, and other critical interventions to improve our understanding of how to best use the improve, best use and improve existing tools. There is also a need for evidence base that is intentionally and scientifically evaluates the impact of interventions to improve healthcare policies and practice. As a country, we need to gather evidence for NHI benchmarks on how much should services and comorbidities cost during NHI implementation. Mortality and morbidity due to non-communicable diseases has continued to rise exponentially due to the increased incidence of neoplasms, cardiovascular disease, and ischemic heart diseases. There has been an observed correlation of severe COVID-19, including death, with one or more NCDs such as diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and renal failure. The National Department of Health has recently launched the National Strategic Plan on the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases 2022 to 2027. The aim of the strategy is to move South Africa closer to achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3.4 to produce by one third premature mortality from NCDs through prevention and treatment and promote mental health and well-being by 2030 through the progressive, progressive improvement of wellness and reduction of premature mortality, morbidity, disability, and mortality from NCDs. Major challenges persist in strengthening the generation and use of research evidence. These include um, securing sufficient research funding, building adequate capacity, avoiding poor targeted low quality research production, and underutilizing research findings. Strengthening a national health system remains pivotal in addressing these challenges in order to improve health. South African Department of Health has developed and is implementing comprehensive national strategy policy and legislation for health research covering four health research systems functions, namely stewardship, governance, financing, capacity building and producing and producing and using research. As a sector, we need to continue advocating for better health research resources, even during these tough financial times. As decisions not backed by evidence are often very costly. We cannot afford to leverage the research known to bring about better and quicker solutions to health sector challenges. The public health significance of the EMUs has been impressive and has grown in stature over the years. They continue to improve South African Medical Research Council's transformation efforts as hosted at some historical disadvantaged institutions. Importantly, in the contribution of research groups that are proactively addressing new and emerging threats, especially those that culminate in public health emergencies such as COVID-19. 
rapid and responsive research with, with a view to optimize development of new health solutions such as vaccines, therapeutics, and rapid diagnostic tools must also conduct other research priorities, e.g. socio-behavioral research, applied and translational research is paramount. We believe that these four research units will put South Africa at the forefront of innovative research and lead in their areas of research globally. As the department, we wish to, we wish the new directors well in their new role and we look forward to a meaningful collaboration. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matlangu. Uh, I think we are now going to an item where, remember I mentioned earlier that we're going to play a video from the Deputy Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Sibongi Seni Lomo. So I just want to cue my technical guys to assist us with that. But while they do that, I want to really re-emphasize the message that came from uh, Dr. Matlangu that research organizations and centers and institutions should be pretty much intentional about the work that they do. And above that, they must be relevant in the research that they, 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 they conduct. And I must say, I think that speaks directly to what the SMRC has been doing over the years and constantly so to you know, continuously reevaluate itself and the work that they do in order to make sure that they stay relevant, in order to make sure that they respond to not only the current uh, challenges, but also the future challenges. Um, and I think uh, the launch of these four units that we are launching today speaks directly to that. And uh, uh, so we will be playing that video now from the Deputy Minister of Health, Honorable uh, Dr. Sibongiseni Lom. And after that, as we are queuing our video, after that item, uh, I'm going to request all the UDs to just quickly come to the front uh, so that we can arrange for Professor Gray and Prof. Uh, Zalke to just hand over the placards to all. But what we will do afterwards, I think we will have a slightly rearrangement. Um, we, we might want to move perhaps this banner to this side so that it creates a better space for photo ops. Um, with the ben, with the placards, but also in Jay, uh, at that item where there's a photo opportunity. Um, so we'll get to that. But for now, let's give over to the Deputy Minister. Okay. It gives me great pleasure to preside virtually at the official launch of the four new South African Medical Research Council extramural research units. The launch of these new extramural units is critical to the council delivering on its current strategic plan and strengthening its role in supporting the National Department of Health on outcomes two of the negotiated service delivery agreement that is a long and a healthy life for all South Africans. Allow me to congratulate Professor Nancy Pashua Namafuya from the University of Johannesburg, Professor Pascal Besong from the University of Venda, Professor Colette Dandara and Dobegon Tusi, both from the University of Cape Town as directors of these extramural research units. It is heartening to note that these four research units will be led by Black African researchers who have over the years made outstanding scientific contributions to the advancing scientific and building the knowledge base in their respective disciplines. You join a group of distinguished past and present South African Medical Research Council unit directors who have made seminal contributions to the improving the quality of life of all South Africans. Well, Professor Refilio Nancy Paswana Mafuya Unit, called Pan African Center for Epidemics Research Unit, will focus on improving the understanding of current pandemics 
through cutting edge pan African and global research epidemiological and public health studies among marginalized populations in diverse low socioeconomic settings in South Africa, in Sub Saharan Africa, and globally. Well, Professor Pascal Pesok, UNIT, an antimicrobial resistance and global health research unit, will focus on, con on conducting research on microbial, human, and environmental determinants of the acquisition and transmission of antimicrobial resistance. They will collaborate with community and policymakers to enhance our understanding of the dynamics of antimicrobial research, antimicrobial re research resistance for improved antimicrobial resistance stewardship. Or Professor Colette Dandara's unit is called the Platform for Pharmacogenomics Research and Transmission Research Unit, which will focus on identifying inherited genetic variations, epigenetic changes in microbial profiles that are associated with inter-individual differences in the ways patients respond to therapeutic treatment, including herbal medicines, a field commonly referred to as pharmacogenomics. Well, Professor Dobegon Dusi's unit is called Intersection of Non Communicable Disease and Infectious Disease Research Unit. This one will focus on enhancing the understanding and management of the, of the interaction between endemic infections such as SARS COVID 19, HIV, and tuberculosis, and non communicable disease which includes heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, mellitus, obesity, cancer, and mental health. As new unit directors, your role is firmly to establish key enabling platforms to facilitate the generation of new knowledge through world-class applied research Secondly, to train and mentor a new generation of high quality postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows in the multidisciplinary research. And in so doing, equip them to compete in the science and education sectors nationally and internationally. Thirdly, to increase the body of scientific knowledge through research translation into products patents, research papers, policy, practice and health promotions, including that to the genetic public. And fourthly, to increase the number of healthcare innovations and to produce patents, health products based on new discoveries and new research. As you may know, the Department of Health Strategic Plan of 2020-2021 right up to 2024-2025 is firmly grounded in strengthening the health system. In total, 12 of the 18 outcomes prioritized by the Department of Health are geared to strengthen the health systems and improve quality of care with the remaining five outcomes responding to the quadruple burden of disease in South Africa. Research and innovations towards achieving these will help go a long way to ensure quality health services and effective coverage that are achieved. To all health researchers gathered here, I wish to remind you of the National Health Research Committee, a body established by the Department of Health under the National Health Act. Its role is to determine the health research to be carried out by public health authorities ensure that health research agendas and research resources focus on priority health problems, develop and advise the minister on the application and implementation of an integrated national strategy for health research and coordination of the research activities of public health authorities. I implore you to work closely together in improving the quality of life 
of all South Africans. In closing, I would like to congratulate the South African Medical Research Council in fulfilling its mandate of funding and conducting excellent research and importantly delivering high impact health interventions to support the development of health in its endeavor to create a healthier life for all. I'm especially pleased to see the increases in the proportions of Black Africans supported in this method through your many research entities and programs. We wish you well in, in the success in your event. I thank you. Today, it gives me great pleasure to preside virtually at the official launch of the four new South African Medical Research Council extramural research units. The launch of these new extramural units is critical to the council delivering on its current strategic plan and strengthening its role in supporting the National Department of Health on outcomes two of the negotiated service delivery agreement that is a long and a healthy life for all South Africans. Allow me to congratulate Professor Nancy Pashwa Namafuya from the University of Johannesburg, Professor Pascal speak and then only for us to go back to the photo ops would be um, and I'm going to request uh, the assistance of my colleagues just to perhaps after she's done with her speech maybe just to move the banner towards this side to allow us to take the photo ops with the banner in the background but for now let me call upon Professor Lisa. Prof over to you. Thank you very much. Um, program director, and I'm, and I'm not going to give a speech. Um, I've been honored to ask just to close with a vote of thanks. Um, so to the leadership in the room, our partners and our colleagues, all protocol observed. And, and I want to start with that, because if I just look at the protocol of the people in this room, it's astounding. Um, we are dealing here with leadership in academy, in our academic institutions, the SAMRC, um, all of our councils, and it really speaks to the partnerships and the collaborations within this room. I think this room can certainly change the world. So I just want to thank all of you in particular for your time and your commitment and being here and being here to support the launch of these four amazing new units. So um, really a deep um, vote of thanks to each one of you um, for that. Um, I do have to thank our program director. Thank you so much for almost keeping us exactly on time. Um, I have a German surname and therefore I'm very strict about time, but I think we're going to finish um, exactly on time, including our chance to network and collaborate and plan new interventions going forward. Let us thank our three speakers. Um, Professor Kelly Shibali, thank you very much for um, taking up the invitation to speak about partnerships and how important that is going forward. Um, then um, um, Dr. Mklango, um, thank you very much for not only um, reading the speech but listening to those wonderful talks that preceded you and I know you will take it back. Uh, to Dr. Butelezi, and of course thanking um, our Deputy Minister for recording that speech. Um, I also feel it's very important whenever we have an occasion to, uh, to acknowledge those who have spent time not only in this room but online. So I know all of the four units have got their, uh, their teams, their students, their administrative support watching. We also know that our intramural program uh, um, uh, colleagues are watching and some of our other extramural programs uh, are watching as well. Shay and Andre are here to represent that whole group, but that is another extraordinary group to leverage going forward. And so we look forward um, to also building bridges between those various aspects of the SAMRC. And then I really want to end by thanking most sincerely our four unit directors and their particular teams, not only for getting the applications in at 000, um, and the leadership that allowed for that, but their commitment and their passion, which we really could see so strongly today, and their vision for what they're going to achieve in those units. 
um, we have a joint mandate as the SAMRC and all of these units, a healthier life, lives for all who live in South Africa, conducting, empowering, and promoting research, and of course, as the headline for today, strengthening the health systems of our country. So a special thank you and a very sincere congratulations uh, to the three of you in the room and for the PACER colleagues, please pass on um, to your uh, director. So this is not now quite the close because there will still be photo opportunities, um, but I would welcome all of you to stay on if it's possible to do so, um, to network over some refreshments, and we really are um, very much appreciative of all of you've done. The final thanks is to the team. So there's a massive team behind any of these um, uh, launches and units, and so I just really want to thank everybody that's been working, perhaps behind the scenes, but I think you've all got the emails, and you've all got the texts, so I just want to thank in particular Dr. Rafil Wezwane, um, Dumi and his team, all of the teams here at the hotel and behind the scenes, thank you so much for all the exceptional work that you've done, um, and really thank you to all of you again for being here. So I think at this point, um, that's the end of the official um, part of the day, but I'm going to uh, ask our three unit directors to come up so that we can pass on your plaques and take some wonderful photographs with you. So to the three of you.